Lord be with you. Hey, Lyndon, can you push me forward there on the title slide? Well, we're going to continue our series working through the Advent season. And if you will recall, we began this season looking at hope. And we see how within the Proto-Evangelium, or the first good news, we find that there is hope for humanity. In fact, we see that when Adam and Eve first sinned and rebelled, it seemed as if they were in a hopeless situation with sin and death reigning, with with a serpent deceiving them. But we saw that God didn't just leave humanity with this horrible curse. Rather, we see that there was a promise of hope and the fact that we saw that there would be a, a seed or a child that would come and crush the serpent's head, ending sin, ending death, and destroying darkness and Satan, the one who is responsible for it all. We then looked and saw how we also find in Jesus not only hope, but also we find joy. And we looked at the story of Mary, and we saw how the joy that Mary experienced in being able and being chosen to bear the Son, who would be the Savior of the world, how that same joy that she felt, we can now experience. Because for anyone who turns from their sins and trusts in Christ, now has the Spirit of Christ living within them. So then you now become a Christ bearer, a joy bearer. So we saw hope in Christ. We we saw joy in Christ. And then what we saw last week was we saw the message of peace given to the very fearful shepherds. And we saw that through Christ, we also have peace. And that word is really leading towards shalom, which is more than just the absence of war, but it's a, a total wholeness. It's where all of our brokenness, all of our shortcomings are made new and made complete once again. So Christ actually makes us new creations. He gives us true peace with God and we see with man. And then at our candlelight, service, we looked at the superiority of love. And we saw not only does Christ give us hope, does he give us joy, does he give us peace, but he also shows us true love, unconditional agape love. And we see the extent of that love on full display through the incarnation, through his coming to the world, because we see how he gave up so much because he loved us. We saw that he gave up his home in heaven. He was on the throne and he chose to step down and to come into the world. He, he stepped down into a place of death, of sin, of people who were going to hate him. We also see that he gave up his glory, not that he relinquished his divinity, but he came in the form of an infant and then he took the, the, um, the service of a, of a servant. He took that place of a bond servant and he showed his obedience, which ultimately led to what he gave, which was he gave his life. So he gave up his home, he gave up his glory, and he gave up his own life because of his love for us. So we've seen these different facets of Advent, of the hope, joy, peace, and love. And through this, we've been able to actually focus in on a lot of the different figures that you would see on a common nativity, in which we have one right here in front on the Lord's table. And so if you notice, we've, we've looked at some of the different perspectives, right? We've, we've talked about Mary. We've talked about Joseph. We've talked about some of the angels. We've talked about the shepherds. But if you've noticed, there's one group that we really haven't addressed yet, and that would be the um, the three men here, um, which can be called the, the, the three kings, the, the wise men, the magi. You've probably heard them refer to um, a different types of ways. Well, that's who I want us to key in on today and look at um, these individuals who began to search for a king. And really what they did is as they were searching for a king, they found a savior. And so that's what I want us to do. And it's going to be in Matthew chapter 2, if you haven't already Turn there. I do want to invite you to turn with me. We're primarily going to be looking at verses 1 to 12 this morning. And so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story, but basically what happens is it takes place after the birth of Jesus. You see in verse 1, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, we see that there are these men from the east, and it doesn't tell us exactly where in the east. They're just 
east, right? And it says that these individuals, they saw a star in the sky. And this star they refer to as his star in the text. And that's referring to this child that was born, this, um, this savior or king that, that was to be born. And so because they saw the star, they, they recognized that it was his star. And so they were um, committed to going to where the star was pointing. And they wanted to go there and they wanted to worship the child that was born. And so what they do is they, they head off and they end up getting to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem there, they um, are asking around about this Christ child, right? And this obviously would cause quite a buzz because, you know, they would be coming and they probably would have been different as they are from the East. They're Gentiles coming into Jewish territory. And they're also asking about this king who's being born. And so it, it gets the attention of King Herod, who is right there in Jerusalem. And so what he does is he basically brings these wise men and basically wants to hear basically what are they looking for and what's going on. And so they basically explain to him that they saw the star and the star was a sign of this um, child who was to be born and they were coming to worship the king of the Jews. And so he hears this and it's interesting, Herod um, doesn't know where the, the Messiah or the Christ is supposed to be born because if, you, if he knew his Old Testament or the, the Hebrew scriptures of the time, he would have known that Micah 5.2 actually says where the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. But he doesn't know that. And so he's hearing, and the wise men are asking, do you know where he's to be born? And so what he does is he, he rounds up his chief priests, his scribes, right? A lot of those religious leaders that he would have had in his entourage that would have given him counsel. And he's like, so where is he supposed to be born? And then what they do is they quote Micah 5.2. And they basically say, Bethlehem. And so what Herod does is he sends the wise men to Bethlehem and he tells them specifically, and when you find him, make sure you tell me because I also want to come and worship him. Now, we obviously know later in the story, that's not Herod's intentions, right? Herod is really wanting to destroy the child. And that actually, once again, relates back to what we saw in the very beginning in the garden with the proto-evangelium, right? We know that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent, but we know the serpent is wanting to bruise the heel, right? So we see how there's this battle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the devil. We see through Herod, we see that there's this goal to destroy the child, to kill the child. And so what Herod does later in the story is he actually ends up trying to kill all of the innocents, all of the infants in the region, trying to snuff out the life of the Messiah. But he says, let me know so I can come and worship him. So he's lying to the wise men. And the wise men, they go, and as they are heading towards Bethlehem, it says that the star reappears. So that shows us that the star wasn't always um, able, or they weren't always able to see um, the star. But it says that they saw the star and it went before them, and then the star places itself right above the house of where this child is at. And so then from there they go in, they see Jesus for the first time, they bow down, they worship him, and then after that we see the famous gifts that they bring, right? They bring the gold, they bring frankincense, and they bring myrrh. And then um, all of this is being celebrated as they're so ecstatic in seeing Christ, the, the king that they had been searching for. And then after that, we see that they have a dream that tells them not to go back to Herod and that they are to depart a different way. So we see these wise men in this story. And like I said, there's only, they're only mentioned within about 12 verses of this narrative that we just looked at. And they come in to the story of scripture and then they exit as quickly as they came. And you might be wondering, well, like, what or who are these mysterious magi or this mysterious wise men, right? Like, what do we, what do we know about them? Well, actually, what you'll find is there's a lot of things that have been brought through tradition and through art that we actually sometimes have a, um, a false understanding of who these men actually were. Um, and one of them, as I said earlier, you probably have heard, um, that they are called three kings in, in stories, right? You hear we three kings. Well, we don't have any biblical evidence to know that they were even kings. 
right? We see that they're called in the text. It says that they were um, magi. If you actually look um, at the, the Greek there, they're called magi. And then most translations will call them wise men. But we never actually see them referred to as, as kings, um, which is interesting. But you might be like, well, what is magi? Well, it kind of sounds like the word magic. And that's because there would be within this term magi it's kind of a broad term that can encompass a lot of different professions and a lot of different focuses and so scholars are not completely um in agreement on exactly what it is that they did and how they functioned but we do see later in the book of acts this term is used again for a sorcerer so we can see that in some sense magi could be functioning with with black magic of some sort However, we also see that there could be um, the thought that maybe that these individuals were also maybe in the functioning of, of being a seer or maybe being like a dream interpreter like, like the prophet Daniel was. He was able to interpret dreams and so they would seek out these wise men to, to see things or to interpret dreams or they might even mix some of the things with, um, with the black magic or some type of sorcery. But we also know that there's many who think that the Magi were also, maybe with a combination of some of these other things, really focused on the stars. And in fact, that many think that they may have been astrologers, and what they would do is they basically would be students of the stars. They would look at the planets, the, the, you know, the celestial bodies, um, and they would see how they move, and, um, and they would you know, start to name them. And, and, and you obviously know that those who travel the seas would have to navigate the stars. And so it could be that these were experts in this area, which would make sense why they were aware of a specific star as they would be studying the sky. And maybe they even used those things to make interpretations or give counsel in, in different areas of life. So, but we see these magi, and we see that they're not called kings. You also might know that there weren't necessarily three of them. We say the three wise men, or the three kings. Well, obviously, it looks nice on the table to balance out, right, the nativity, but um, it never says that there were three, if you read the text, right? Where do we get the number three? I'm sure many of you have probably heard this. The gifts that they bring, right? The gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So, some have just thought, well, there's three gifts, three wise men. Well, most likely, there were probably actually a lot more. We know there were at least two because they're, they're plural, but it actually was most likely that there was a lot more of them because, one, if you're traveling with that expensive of gifts, you're probably not just going to go all by your lonesome. Also, if they were wealthy, which most likely they were, they would have had an entourage going with them, a caravan traveling with them with their supplies because you would have had to eat, you would have had to have shelter, you would have had to have a lot of things as you're traveling this great distance. And so actually, there probably would have been a lot more. In fact, that would have also made sense why it caused kind of um, a disturbance um, and troubled Herod because they see this huge Gentile caravan coming into his community asking about a king. That would cause some, some worry or some trouble, right? And so we see then that they, they were called magi, that there were um, not necessarily three of them. And then the other thing that's really interesting is that we see them in the nativity, but I'm sure many of you have probably also heard this as well, but we, it's most likely that the wise men were not even present at the birth of Christ. So if you just glance through um, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, you'll notice that a certain word is not used in this text, and the word is baby or babe, or infant. The word that's typically translated here is child, or young child, but in Luke's gospel, whenever it's recording the shepherds coming, seeing the baby in a manger, we actually see a different Greek word there that would mean infant. Now, this word that's being used here in Matthew, it could encompass a newborn, but most translators tend to think that it's usually describing an older child. So, in one sense, we see that that could be a sign that maybe this is later that maybe Jesus has actually grown a little bit since his, his birth. We also see in verse 1 that it says, after Jesus was born. Now, you could be thinking, well, a minute after Jesus is born, you know, then it's after. But it seems that it's maybe indicating that it's after the time of that, that it has occurred. We also know that if they are coming from the east, and if they started traveling when Jesus was born, they never would have gotten there in time because it would have been hundreds of miles and I've even seen um, um, certain maps and, and, and guesses that it could have been even up to 900 miles that they were traveling to get to Jesus and obviously we know that would have taken months if not even longer to get to Jesus. We also see that it says that when they get to Jesus they're in a house. Now if you take 
the earlier or the passage of Luke where it says there was no room for them in the inn, and you take that to be like a a um, like a ancient hotel or, or lodging facility, and you think, well, maybe he had to go to a stable or go to a cave to be born. Well, then he wouldn't have been in a house there. Now, if you take the other view that the the word inn in the Greek is referring to a guest room, then he would have already been in a house. But if you do take it that he wasn't in a house when he was born, well, now he is in a house. So that would point once again to there was some moving in location there. And then the final thing that I think is maybe one of the most telling is that after Herod finds out he is deceived, that the wise men don't come to him, they actually head out. And then Herod, what he does is he makes the edict to kill all children two years and under. Now, if the wise men had gone on the night of his birth and then they didn't come back like the next day, it wouldn't have made very much sense to go and kill two years and under. Rather, you'd be like any newborn. Right? Or even a year or, or, or six months old. Or, you, know, you wouldn't need it to be two years old, but we see that Herod, the way he decided, is based on when they saw the star. So the star had apparently been there uh, approximately two years that the, the wise men had been watching it and seeing it. So, so these things would point to the fact that most likely the wise men or the magi, they weren't actually at the nativity. So you're thinking, okay, we don't really know who the Magi were. We don't know how many of them they were, uh, there were. And we don't even know if they actually were there on the night of his birth. So then what do we know? Well, I think that there are some things that we, as we look to the text, can learn about these individuals. But I would, what really want to argue is that what we learn from them is not as much as important as what we actually find out about who the Magi were, but more so about who Jesus is. And I think what you're going to see here is that when we start to look at the actions and the things that the, the Magi do, it really just shows us about why we celebrate Christmas, about who our Savior is. And so that's the first thing that I want to draw from the text, is that I think what we see is that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is for everyone. It was already mentioned earlier, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That is, he loved the cosmos, all different types of people groups. 1 John 4, 14 also says, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Why do I bring this up? Well, the shepherds that we saw last week were poor Jewish individuals. Now we come to this week looking at the Magi, and it's like the exact opposite. You see rich Gentiles. And both groups are getting the news that the Savior has come. And so what that to me is showing us, it's reaffirming all of these other scriptures about God's love for the world, that Jesus is the Savior of the world, because we're seeing the poor people, you can be saved. The rich people, you can be saved. The Jew, you can be saved. The Gentile, you can be saved. He's saying, everyone, this gift that God has given to humanity is for every single human being. And so what that means is that Christmas is all-inclusive. That means that for you, this gift has been given. It's just a matter of what you do with the gift of Christ. And I just love this because obviously this means that I can be saved, right? That means you can be saved, and that's so amazing, but I've thought more and more about this, about my own personal salvation, and as I have become a father, and I, I think about my children, I've become even more emotional about the gospel, and what I find is I'm not as excited about my salvation as I am from the fact that Jesus also came to save my children. Have you ever thought about that? That Jesus didn't just come to save you, but also you can look at your sons and your daughters and the generations that are following after that, and you can say, he came to save my descendants. He came to, to save the entire world. I think that is why we celebrate Christmas. He is that Savior. And because of that, that means that no one is too far from God that Jesus can't reach them. That's really the message and the purpose of Christmas, isn't it? The purpose of the incarnation is that Jesus comes from heaven to earth. You can't get much further away than a different dimension right? He comes from a different dimension from heaven to the earth to seek and to save that which was lost. He's searching far 
and wide to save as many people that will trust in him. And that's just amazing that that's the type of God that we serve. And the reason I even mention this is because in verses 1 to 2 of chapter 2, it describes them as these wise men or the magi from the east. And I think that there's a reason that the Holy Spirit led Matthew to use the term east. Now, the Holy Spirit probably could have revealed, like, where in the east, right? But instead, it just says east, and I think that the purpose is that it's really vague. And why is it vague? It's because it's what it, I think it's showing us is that these origins are pointing to the corners of the earth. Far away, that way, we see God is still speaking. God is still calling. God is still searching for these lost sinners. And so even these magi from the east can be saved. And what's interesting, too, is that these become the first Gentiles to worship at the feet of Jesus. Now, I don't know everyone's you know, background, but most likely most of you are Gentiles. That means you are not a Jew, ethnically. And what that means is you follow in the same line as these wise men who came and worshiped at the feet of of Jesus. But though we don't necessarily know their origins, there have been obviously some ideas. Some scholars bring up the idea that it could have been potentially Persia or Babylon because both of those groups, remember associating with Daniel, who had connections with both, had a lot of these individuals who studied the stars, who did seeing and who practiced some of these different practices that the Magi seem to have. And there's even a group called the Wise Men in those um, in those circles. And so some have think, well, maybe it's Persia or, or Babylon. And if that's the case, once again, that's going to be 500 to 900 miles away. So God's holy city, the chosen village of Bethlehem, 900 miles away, God is still speaking. God is still seeking. We see that. And I, what I also think is beautiful is that God can also use our imperfections and our superstitions to even draw us to Jesus. Because here's the thing, we don't know their faith background, but if, it, if they are somewhat entangled with some black magic or sorcery, like I said, we don't know exactly, but even if they were doing that and they were doing astrology and using the stars as a symbol and a sign, we see that God can even use our brokenness, use our, our past, and utilize those things for his glory. And we see that he utilizes a star that they are seeking, that they're looking at, studying, and it leads them to Jesus. So we see that you can be found. You can be saved. This Savior is for you. So we see Jesus is the Savior of the world. The next thing that I want to say is that we also see that Jesus is the treasure you seek. Now I know we as human beings, we are all seeking and searching for meaning, for purpose, and for fulfillment. We are. You want to be happy. You want to have comfort. You want to have peace. You want to have these things we've been talking about through the Advent season of hope, joy, peace, and love. Those are the things that we want because we are human, made in the image of God. We are all searching and seeking these things out. But what's so beautiful of the coming of Christ is that the answer has been given. There are so many people out there in this world that are seeking the things that Jesus has come to be the solution. But they're looking in the wrong areas. They're looking in their wealth. They're looking in their health. They're looking in relationships. They're looking in other stuff, status, power, sex, all of these different areas we see people are searching. But Jesus is the one who brings these true things. He offers you the meaning of life. He offers you purpose in life. And he offers you true, lasting fulfillment in life. And I think the wise men recognized this. I think the wise men recognized how valuable Jesus really is. Just think about this. They saw a star in the heavens, and they immediately chase after it. Now, you might not probably be as bold, They see a star, and they say, that's the sign of the Messiah. We're going. Now, I don't think that they're completely off base here. I think there's probably a good reason, because we see that they say it's his star in the text. 
So they must have had some revelation. Now, we don't know if, if an angel came to them that it's not recorded. We don't know if God spoke to them. Or it could be that there are certain scriptures that maybe they had been familiar with. As I had already mentioned Daniel a couple of times. There is a prophecy in Daniel 9 that if they were of Persia or of Babylon, they may have been familiar with. And in Daniel 9, 24 to 25, we actually see that there's a timeline given of when the Messiah is going to come. And so maybe they were looking because they knew there was going to be a sign coming of this Messiah. I want to read this. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. So we see that there's a timeline given from the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple. There's a certain timeline that immediately goes into effect. And when that happens, we see that the Messiah will come. And what's so beautiful about prophecy is you can actually check this. And Jesus came at this time. And so one um, clue might be that they knew Daniel's prophecy that said he will come at this time. And so they were looking and they found the one that Daniel prophesied. But we also have in Numbers 24 verse 17, this is a prophecy given by Balaam. Now, if you remember Balaam, he was the one who was the sorcerer that was trying to curse Israel in the wilderness. And every time he would try to curse them, God would make him bless them. And he was getting furious. He was also the guy on the donkey and the donkey yells at him, right? All that good stuff happening with Balaam. Well, this individual makes a prophecy about the Messiah, even though he didn't want to. And what's so cool is also Balaam is from area around Persia. So once again, a connection to Persia. But it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. So what's so beautiful here is that Balaam prophesies that there's a star that's going to rise out of Jacob. That's of Israel. And then there's a scepter also. So basically, it's a king, a sign of a king who's coming in this region. And this is another individual prophesying way before Christ and also has connections with Persia. So now we're seeing all of these connections saying there's a Messiah coming. Here's when he comes. And here's a star. And it's going to show he's the king. And so now we have these wise men coming from a vicinity, that direction. And they're saying, hey, we have this revelation. So they have the revelation of a star that Jesus is born, and then they pursue him. They chase after him. They're committed because they see the value of this king, and they chase after the star. And some might be wondering, well, what exactly was this star? Because as you read the text, the star seems to have some unique qualities. It seems to appear, disappear, it moves, it goes over a house, and it stops. Well, there are some different potentials of what the star may have actually been. Some um, think maybe a comet. Um, because we know comets can move at different rates and, you know, and they, they aren't exactly like a star would be and how we perceive them from, from, from the earth. Um, so some have maybe proposed maybe some type of comet. Um, some have thought maybe Jupiter, the planet, because actually we're able to study the, their, their, their paths and their rates. And actually right around the time of his birth, Jupiter would have been going right there to where it would have been able to be seen and it would have shined brighter. So some think maybe it's actually um, Jupiter because the, by, the word, by the way, the word that's used for star here really is just covering a, a broad range of celestial bodies, right? We think, well, that's not a star, but remember our science today of how we categorize and label things, it was a word that meant something in the heavens that was shining that they could perceive, right? So some think maybe Jupiter. Some think it's just an identified celestial body. We just don't know. It's a star. It could have been a star that God put there, or it could have been a star that's always been there, and maybe this we can't see it anymore for whatever reason. Maybe God took it away. We, we just don't know. Um, but it could have been that. Some think maybe an angel, that maybe um, the angel took the form of a bright light and was guiding their way. And then the final one that I've seen as um, a potential is that maybe it's just God's glory. With the presence of Christ, we see God's glory leading them to the Savior. And that kind of reminds you of, remember, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, that God's glory and presence would lead the people of Israel through the wilderness. It could have been something like that where he was leading them to Jesus. So whatever 
um, whatever view you take, though, we see that when they saw it, they went after it, and they were willing to travel hundreds of miles for it just to worship. Think about that. They would travel this far, risk so much because there could have been weather issues, there could have been travel issues, there could have been people trying to take their stuff and attacking them because crime was much more rampant in this way where if you were traveling, it was dangerous. And like also, by the way, people get sick and die from traveling like this. You don't have a nice comfy car or plane, right? And this is going to take a huge portion, a huge chunk out of your life. But I think what the, the reason is is that their wealth, because they had wealth, their power, their influence, their wisdom, because they were wise men, they knew that it did not compare to Jesus. Is that what it's like for you? That your wealth, your power, your influence, your wisdom, none of it compares to who Jesus is is. And I think that's why we call it Christmas. Sometimes we get so bogged down with all the other things going on with Christmas. Remember, it's all about Christ. When they were searching and following that star, they knew it was all pointing to Jesus. Does your Christmas festivities, are they going to point to Jesus or are they going to start to point to something else? Because I know that we can see materialism and sadly even family can become the God of Christmas. You have to remember your family is not the reason for the season. Now, it's a blessing that God has given you, but your family is not the reason for Christmas. Materialism, gifts, those are great. That's not why we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Christmas because of Christ. And that's what the wise men got right. And they were willing to pursue him. But what's so interesting, in verses 4 to 5, you see something else here. It says that the chief priests and the scribes, they knew of where the Messiah was to be born. They knew it, right? And they told the wise men where to go, but you never see in the text, and the chief priests and scribes followed, and they went too. These are the guys that have been studying the word forever, that they knew Micah 5 too. And they said, oh, it's Bethlehem. Oh, well, by the way, he's born. They don't go. They're apathetic about their king, their savior, And I sadly think that we see this in our churches a lot of the time. We have a lot of apathetic worshipers. We wouldn't travel hundreds of miles to go worship Jesus. Some may have even been thinking, it's Christmas Eve. Do we need to go to church on on Sunday? I mean, we got other things to do. We got Christmas festivities, right? You know, I've even heard that in Easter, right? Do we have to have church on Easter? It's like, do you understand what these holidays are about, right? Right? But that's the thing. These these chief priests, they didn't go. And remember, Jerusalem is five miles. It's five miles to go see your king and your savior. Won't do it. Some people won't drive two miles to church. Some people won't pick up their Bibles just to read for five minutes with God. There are so many things that we're just apathetic in our worship, in our relationship with Christ, where Christ came from heaven to earth to save you and die. He cares. We need to care. We need to treasure Christ. And in fact, Matthew 13, we see how we see the kingdom of heaven being described as a treasure. It says, Matthew 13, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Is that how you view Christ? Is that how you view the kingdom of heaven? That when you found it, when you realized who he was and what that signified, that there's nothing else in this world that I won't give up for Jesus. I will risk my life. I will travel miles. I will give up all of my possessions if it means that I can find Jesus. That's what these wise men do. That's what they show us and they teach us. They call us to um, forsake that apathetic worship and to love him and cherish him with all that we have. And what's beautiful too is that when you seek Jesus... You find Jesus. See, the wise men, they didn't know how they were going to do it because once again, the star didn't get them there. The star got them to Jerusalem and they needed another prophecy. They needed the word of God to get them the rest of the way. And then that's when they see the star again to go to Bethlehem. But we see here that they continued to seek Jesus and they were able to find him. And that reminds me of Jeremiah 29, 13, which says, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Some of you aren't finding Jesus because you aren't really searching for him. Some of you aren't really experiencing the things that he brings with hope, joy, peace, and love because you're not really abiding in him. If you want the things that Christ offers, you have to search for him with your whole 
heart and the promise that God gives us, and you will find him. And that's what the wise men found. They found Christ, and in Christ they actually found true wisdom. How cool. Wise men seek the wise one. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 3 and verse 9, it says, In whom all hidden, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, for in him, that is Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So in this baby, in this child, we see that he has all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He has the Godhead fully within him. So if you want wisdom, if you want knowledge, if you want everything that God has to offer, you need Jesus. That's what you need. And so we see that the truly wise thing that we could ever do is seek and search out Jesus. And so that's what we see with the wise men. We see through the wise men that Jesus is the savior of the world, and we see that Jesus is the treasure that we seek. And then the final thing that I think we see from this text in verses 10 to 11 is that we see that Jesus is also worthy of our worship. In verses 10 to 11, it says this. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Aren't you so glad that the Magi didn't travel hundreds of miles, get there, and they say, this is it? I mean, that would have been really bad if they're like, this was not worth the trip. We're not giving you anything. But instead, as soon as they saw the star, saw the place, saw the child, it says they're rejoicing. And as soon as they're in the presence of this young child, which by the way, think of these grown men seeing a young child and they immediately fall to the ground. We see their humble spirits bowing down in worship to the Christ child. And then after they express this expressive worship, they then give gifts. And so we see exactly how we should want to worship Jesus. We should want to fall at his feet. We should want to praise his holy name. And we should want to give him gifts. And so I want to just for a second look at those gifts. I'm sure you've probably heard messages on the gifts specifically. Because what's interesting is not only are they substantial gifts because they were very costly and it actually would have ended up supplying for Joseph and Mary for them to be able to depart and pay for their travel because Herod was going to try to kill them. So God's providing here. But we also see that within these gifts, they also have some symbolic significance that a lot of Christians have picked up over the years. Because we see gold, which gold, by the way, would have been like one of the most you know, pricey, best gifts you can get, that's going to do a lot. We know that gold continues to keep value even in our world today, right? So gold was obviously a great blessing, but the significance of it symbolically is that gold usually pointed to like royalty. They would be crowned with gold. So in a sense, we see that they're pointing to Christ being a king. Frankincense is a type of incense. And if you know anything about the tabernacle or the temple, what the priests would have to do, they would burn incense to cover them as they would go into the Holy of Holies in the presence of God. And so what we're seeing here then is when there's frankincense, that might be pointing to his divinity. You are in the presence not only of a king, but you're in the presence of God. So this is a divine king. And in fact, you also would see frankincense sometimes being used for anointing oil that priests would use. So you see him being our king, our God, and our high priest who's going to make all things possible for us to be with God again. And then the final thing is is myrrh. And so some of you maybe have heard this, but myrrh basically would be used for like embalming, right? And and so what you would do with that is it was kind of like bitter, sweet perfume. And in fact, there's the song, The We Three Kings, and that's the way that it uses it because it has kind of like a bitter, sweet smell and scent, and it has medicinal purposes, but usually it's associated with death. And so what this is actually um, probably pointing to is how the bittersweet death of Christ. When Christ comes to the cross, we see that it's bitter in the sense that He died. It was an injustice. We obviously would have mourned if we saw him dying on the cross, but we also see the sweet effects of it as well because through his death, salvation came to the world. And so through these gifts, what we actually see then is we see the identity of Christ and we see the destiny of Christ. 
You literally see the whole story of the gospel just within these gifts. This king who is God came to die with a bittersweet reward. And so we see all of this playing out through Jesus, who is our king, our God, and our savior. And because he is all of these things to us for the world, he alone is worthy of our worship. And in fact, in Revelation 5, you see um, heaven basically crying and singing this praise out. They're saying he alone is worthy. And I just want to read this for you in closing. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, pointing to his death, and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth So they are praising Christ in heaven for what he came to do on Christmas. Why he came. He now is worthy. He is the one that has prevailed. He has conquered sin and death. He has given us life. He has given us light. He has given us the way for and towards God. So that's why we come to celebrate Christmas. And so our response, hopefully then, will be what these wise men did. Let us worship and let us give our gifts. And just like these gifts point to who Christ is, You need to maybe check how is your worship? What are the gifts you are bringing to your king? Do they reveal his worth? I'm sure you've probably received a gift or a present at some point around Christmas time. And whenever you've received that gift, you were shocked by what they gave you because it showed how much they loved you. They were ascribing worth to you. That's what worship is. It's worth-ship. When you live your life the way you live and demonstrate your obedience to Christ, that is your gift to the Savior. Does the way you live point to Christ being your King, your God, and your Savior? I hope it does. Let us pray. Father, we love you and we give you praise. We thank you so much for sending Jesus. The reason for the season, season, the Savior of the world the true treasure that we should seek. And in him, we see the one who is worthy of all our worship, all of our praise and honor. So Lord, I pray that we would just fall at his feet, that we would bear gifts of praise and love as we continue to honor and celebrate him this season. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.